we are on the, the cusp of Independence Day, as uh, it, we can always tell at the beach because it becomes the busiest week of the year here on the island. Uh, you don't want to go OTB over the bridge unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> but you know that Independence Day is coming when you see all those crowds. Uh, and, and, and of course, we are prepared to celebrate our freedom. We hold these truths to be self-evident, says the Declaration, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now there's something extraordinary in those words, and most people think that the extraordinary part is that whole pursuit of happiness. But you have to go back a little further, because it's something that should not be missed. All are endowed by their Creator. The source of our freedom, the source of all of our life, is our Creator. Freedom is a gift of God. And like all of God's good gifts, we are called to practice faithful stewardship of it. So, what does faithful stewardship look like for us? How are we supposed to be faithful stewards of this gift of freedom? Well, we see it reflected in our scripture for today, which we find in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 11. And he writes, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that though they may malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. <coughs> For it is God's will that by doing right, you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people. Yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Independence Day, or, or really almost any national holiday, can, can sometimes be sort of tricky ground to maneuver for Christians. It can be confusing, because after all, for a good bit of our history, uh, the church has had a, a somewhat uneasy relationship with the state. As Peter says, Followers of Christ live as aliens and exiles in our world because our ultimate allegiance is first and foremost to the kingdom of God. In his letter to the Philippians, St. Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven. Of course, those words are written in a time when most people really were not citizens on earth. Uh, in the early days uh, of, uh, as we had in the early days of our country, the Roman Empire did not count slaves as citizens. And they had over 60 million slaves. Like us, they also did not at first count women. Unlike us, however, the Romans saw Christians as a threat. See, some people believe that Christians were cannibals because of our practice of the Lord's Supper, of eating the flesh and drinking the blood. Uh, our predecessors were also accused of immorality because of the command to love one another. And that command was misunderstood by those outside the church. Accusations were made that they hurt the economy, that they, they tampered with family relationships, that they incited slaves to rise up and revolt against their masters. And most of all, they were cast as being unpatriotic because they claimed that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. 
So antagonism uh, from society in general and, and persecution uh, ultimately came out of those false allegations. Now, most of those concerns uh, about Christ's followers seem to be laid to rest when the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity in the year 312. It wasn't long after that that our faith became the official faith of the Roman Empire. But ever since that time, there's been a challenge for, for us to, to figure out how to navigate that relationship with the rulers of our world. Rulers might have been the emperor. It could be a king or a queen, local princes or feudal lords, or even a representative government. But we have all along proclaimed that the words of Psalm 113 are true. The Lord is high above all nations. And that's why even in a wonderful country where we get to participate in our own government, we are, are still in our own way, aliens and exiles. And we are because it's just part of who we are. It's in our DNA as the people of God. The book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. The chosen people of Israel were constantly reminded by God that they were slaves and strangers in the land of Egypt. And as those who have been grafted onto the family tree of Israel, we have to remember that as the people of God, it is our inheritance as well. We are strangers, visitors, wanderers. Peter even begins his letter to the early Christians by addressing it to the exiles of the dispersion. So that word dispersion is also uh, that word we know as diaspora. It is a word that literally means sown abroad. Like, ske like seeds are, are scattered out in a field. You see, God is at work not only in saving believers, but in sending believers as well. He scatters us as seeds of His kingdom among all the nations of the earth. In his great book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this, According to God's will, the Christian church is a scattered people, scattered like seed to all the kingdoms of the earth. That is the curse and its promise. God's people must live in distant lands among the unbelievers but they will be the seed of the kingdom of God in all the world. So how are we supposed to be the seed of the kingdom of God here, in the land of the free, in the home of the brave? We need to listen to Peter when he says, as servants of God, live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. How often have you heard somebody, when they get caught doing something that they really shouldn't be doing, say something like, hey, it's a free country, isn't it? I can do whatever I want. Right? <coughs> and, and especially here at the beach, that seems to take on a whole life of its own. Right? right? Freedom to, to people at the beach seems to, to mean letting it all hang out. And, and in some cases, quite literally. And, you know, there are some things you just can't unsee. <laughs> I, I, I saw it down at Tybee Island this week. Trust me, it's not any different there than here. But, you know, you know if you go out on, on Freeman Park, look at all the people. They treat it like it's their own personal nudist colony. Uh, they, some people seem to think that when they drive off the paved road at the north end, that, that they also leave behind any kind of responsibility, either for their own well-being or for the well-being of people around them, especially the well-being of the, the kids who are out there, much less that of the, the turtle nests or the shorebirds. Uh, and there, there are those who think that renting a home here on the island and getting away from their regular home means that they can behave in ways that they would never think of acting in the place where they live. And that is exactly what Peter is talking about 
when he says not to use freedom as an excuse for evil. I can't think of anything that dishonors the memory of those who fought and died for our freedom more than to use that freedom to behave in ways that hurt ourselves and hurt others. And you know, that's even more true for followers of Christ. There's nothing that dishonors the memory of the one who gave his all to save us from the ways of sin and death than to use that freedom as some sort of pass to sin. Remember, freedom is ultimately a gift of God. And since it is a gift from God, we are supposed to practice good stewardship But how we use that gift. So Peter says that even if we are first and foremost citizens of God's kingdom, even if we are living as aliens and exiles here, we still need to remember that we are a part of the country in which we live. After all, God uses human authority to maintain order. And especially here in our country, where the government is of the people, and by the people, and for the people. We get to participate, and we have a duty as citizens to serve our neighbors, to, to serve our communities. And we have a responsibility to be seeds of God's kingdom wherever our lives happen to be cast. When I graduated from high school, our, our, our uh, graduating class had a quote. It was our class motto. And it was from Edward Bach. He was an immigrant who made his home in the United States. And he built Bach Tower in, in Central Florida in memory of his mother. And he, he liked to use this quote that his mother told him. It says, wherever you go, wherever your lives may be cast, make you the world a bit better or more beautiful because you have lived in it. That could be a message from God for his people. Wherever you go, wherever your lives may be cast, make you the world a bit better or more beautiful because you have lived in it. Peter says that the way we are to make our world better is to Abstain from the desires of the flesh and to conduct yourselves honorably. To put that more into Methodist language, uh, we should first do no harm and second, we should do good. You know, too often, uh, that's not what we're seeking, is it? Too often, our question is, well, how much can I get away with? Or how far is too far? You know, what is one step over the line? Sounds like questions a lot of college students ask at, at, at spring break. Uh, John Wesley and, and, and his friends, when they were in college, believe it or not, asked some of the same questions. In fact, they, they wondered about them, them so much that, that he even wrote his mother to ask her opinion. Something I don't think most college students would do. But this is how Susanna Wesley responded. She said, take this rule, whatever weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, whatever increases the power or authority of the flesh over the spirit, that thing is sin for you, however good it is in itself. How'd you like to have her for a moment? <laughs> Talk about a joy killer. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, she's right. It isn't about how much you can get away with. For us, as followers of Jesus, it is a matter of having the discipline to say no. To say no to the wrong things. Even sometimes to say no to good things. So that we can more fully say yes to the best things. More fully say yes to God. And that is the second part of Peter's advice. He says to conduct yourselves honorably. Uh, but that's one of those cases where the English word doesn't really capture the full meaning. The biblical word for honorable is the Greek word kalos. 
which means lovely, fine, winsome, gracious, noble, excellent. It is the purest and highest form of goodness. It is using our freedom to submit ourselves to God, to be servants of God. And God says we serve Him best by serving those around us in our world. So we can put it this way. Christian freedom is always tempered by Jesus' call to serve. Jesus' call to serve arises from His commandment to love God and to love our neighbor. <coughs> Ultimately, I think St. Augustine puts it best when he says, love God and do what you like. Because you see, if we love God truly, what we like will be in God's will. Love God and do what we like. That is true freedom. We celebrate our freedom as Americans by proclaiming our independence. However, we must faithfully honor that freedom by admitting that we are dependent on the grace of God. We can be free only when we are bound to God in service. And I know it's ironic, but it's true. Because as followers of Christ, we are not free because we can do whatever we like. We are truly free because we can do whatever we ought. Let us pray. Our holy God, it is in your service that we find perfect freedom. And we pray that by the guidance of your Spirit, that you would give us grace to be good stewards of that gift. Let us in our lives honor you, so that in whatever realm we may find ourselves, we may be seeds of your kingdom. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.